Rhonda Abbott, Manager of Veterans Social and Homeless Services for the City of St. Petersburg. And with me today is Dr. Robert Marbot. He is the past CEO and founder of Haven for Hope, which is a 37-acre multi-building campus in San Antonio, Texas, that provides a holistic community for those who are homeless. He's here to assist our community in creating an action plan to address the needs of the homeless people here in St. Petersburg, as well as Pinellas County. Homelessness is such a complex issue that many cities around our nation are facing, and we wanted to provide our viewing audience with important information as we launch an educational campaign to the citizens of St. Petersburg. This segment is the first of a series that we plan to present, and today we are going to discuss several issues that we face here in St. Petersburg and Pinellas County, and some of the plans that as we move forward. Mayor Foster has stated that we can do better. We can do better than a cardboard box on a hard sidewalk. We can do better than what we have been doing. And that becomes our theme for these segments that we will air over the next few months. With that said, I would like to ask the mayor to start us out with about homeless issues, why we should care about homeless issues, and why is the homeless issues so important for St. Petersburg and for you as the mayor. Mayor? Thank you, Rhonda. Mm -hmm. And we absolutely have to do better. We can't afford not to. Homelessness is one of my top five strategic issues for my term. Four reasons as to why we should all care about the homeless issue. Number one, the number of homeless has been growing, yet we have been basically doing the same activities for 25 years in Pinellas County. What we are doing is not working. We can do better. Number two, we can do better helping the homeless individuals. Through history, societies have been judged on how it takes care of the least, the last, and the forgotten. Number three, much of the funds being spent by governments and not-for-profits are not helping the situation, and in some cases are actually enabling homelessness. We can do better for our taxpayers and our donors. And finally, homelessness hurts job growth and stunts economic development. We can do better for our businesses. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn to Dr. Marbot. He's been here with us now since October. You've toured many, many of our agencies who serve homelessness. You've been integral in, in helping with the uh, opening of the Safe Harbor, which is a large uh, shelter in Mid-County. And we would like to hear from you, Dr. Marbot, in regards to, I know you have seven principles that are the guiding principles for Haven for Hope in San Antonio. And so could you please share those with us? The, what, what's really neat in, in, when you look at homelessness is there's a way to be successful at this. And there's a dozen communities out in, across the country that are really doing a good job. And what we were trying to figure out when we were starting Haven for Hope Up is what makes these 12 so successful and virtually all the others you know, mediocre. And what we found is many places were getting 60, 70 percent success rates by doing certain things, whereas a regular shelter was getting five or six percent success rate. So what, what did these all have in common? So we went out and looked at 237 places and we found there were seven things in common with these dozen or so cities that were very, very successful. And that's where we came up with these seven guiding principles and it's how we design buildings, how we hire people, how we activate volunteers how we engage the homeless community, how we work with the for business, the nonprofit, the faith-based community. Uh, first one is a need of culture of transformation. You have to move from the old warehousing mentality, this idea of just, if you think of Maslow hierarchy's need, that sort of base level of food and shelter and water. A lot of really neat programs spend a lot of time there. They're well-meaning, they're well-intended, but if you, if you don't move up that pyramid, you're never gonna get transformation. You're never gonna get somebody off the street. You're never gonna get people to graduate and hold a job and sustain a job on, on the outside. And so to summarize that first one, it's moving from an old enabling behavior like the mayor talked about in many ways, and, and this is not the only community that's doing it the same way the last 25 years, most of the country has. But you have to move from that enabling behavior to an engaging behavior. And we need to engage our volunteers, we need to engage the business community, the elected government, appointed official community, and most importantly, the homeless community uh, themselves. 
and to engage and say, uh, we can simply do better and, and we must do better. Uh, the second is you want to, to integrate as many services as you can. Th this community, I've never been to a community that has so many inherent services already in place, already working in the homeless community. And I've been to dozens and dozens of places. And I, I have never seen a community this rich with services. Uh, there are things in this community uh, in the area of mental health that I'd love to have in places that I've helped or, or in San Antonio. And so how do, you, how do we accentuate those positives? Uh, how do we fill, there's some gaps, how do we fill the gaps? But most importantly, the big thing in this community is how do you integrate those services? How do you bring those services together in a coherent system mm -hmm. where you have transfers and handoffs, where you don't duplicate services and then you fill the gaps uh, that you have? And some of that is, is you gotta create a lot of connective tissue around it and, and you have to integrate the systems and it's everything from systems, it's uh, electronic software, it's, it's community communications, it's a memorandum of understanding. So a lot of ways to do that co-location. Uh, the third is you must have master case management. And this is one thing this community is, is in desperate need of, is somebody who's in charge of, you know, if you were uh, a person coming before and you're homeless, what is your personal plan of engagement? What is your plan to get off the street permanently? Not off the street for a day or two or a month, but, but permanently get off the street, a permanent action plan for yourself. So somebody walks you through the design of that plan, then monitors and manages, and then also does the follow-up on that plan. And that's called master case management, and that's way more than traditional case management. That's coordination, that's being very proactive, it's not a reactive mode. And the cities that have been very, very successful have these master case managers. They have a very low caseload in a traditional sense, and they help get you off, uh, off the street. And in the end, the transformation occurs from within. But you as a community can create that environment and that social service network and the network uh, that brings people together to get that transformation. And if I could just say, we have some wonderful case managers in this community at different agencies. And it's not that we don't have uh, great case management going on, but they're all done in separate agencies. And there's not one case manager overlooking the whole service for one individual. A absolutely. Uh, you, you, phenomenal case managers in mental health, phenomenal case managers in addictive <clears throat> disorders, mm -hmm. uh, some case managers in, in work development and work study and job skills training. But the problem is those three case managers are not being coordinated and who's getting folks to talk to each right. other. And it's not just the interconnecting of those services, it's the sequencing of the services. Uh, when you think about things like dental health, how a person's gonna get in the job, their appearance is very important for dental health. Sure. But that is not necessarily, you're gonna spend a lot of money getting the teeth fixed on day one. On day one, you wanna get that cavity filled so it's no longer painful to eat it in solid food. A lot of the food on the street is really bad and it's mushy and it's because the teeth are bad and fillings are hurting and you're not getting sleep and you're not getting nutrition. So the type of dental care on that first week of entry into a system is very different than the dental care at the back end. So who's determining the sequence? Um, you wouldn't want to go spend a lot of money on, on a dental reconstructive surgery if somebody's not been job trained and ready to go mm -hmm. out into the right. workforce. So, it's that overhanging who coordinates with all the other case managers in, in the sequencing. Um, the, the fourth area, is, and fourth and er, fifth area are, are, are a lot interconnected. And uh, uh, I know we've talked a lot about it, is it's a lot like parenting. You know, you, you have to have positive reward systems, as, which is four, and five is consequences for negative behavior and bad decision making. Um, traditionally, when, you, when I started doing my research, I, I initially had not gone to any places that were considered transformation. I went to the more of a traditional shelter environment. And everybody was treated the same. So if you were cutting up and, and, and being violent or damaging or threatening or not going to your job training, you were treated just the same as somebody who was being successful and doing everything compliant that you were, you were asking folks to do. 
And what you find is you don't get any behavior modification. There's no change that occurs. There's no transformation that occurs from within the slide. A person who's working hard says, well, why am I working hard? I get treated the same way. Person who, who's cutting up says, oh, I have no consequences, so I might as well keep cutting up. Mm -hmm. And so the transformation places actually had layering. So as you did better, different things happened uh, in terms of your personal life. You either got a better sleeping arrangement, you either had more storage, you had more sophisticated job training. But all of it, it's not just rewards for reward's sake, it's rewards that take you toward approximating the outside real world. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very important. On the consequences side, if you come into a transformation uh, shelter, you know, like Pinellas uh, Hope here, when you come in, if you uh, have alcohol on board, if, you, if you're high, if you've been out drinking and drugging, that is not a good environment in a transformation situation. So if you come in and you blow on a breathalyzer uh, and, and you come up positive, you should not be allowed into that, that location and you should have go to the penalty box for some period of time. And I, I think it's important never to give up on anybody. Everybody can be transformed eventually to some level. Uh, so you don't want to give up on people. You don't want to vote them off the planet. But, but, but people do need to have consequences when you come in and you have negative behavior. There has to be strong consequences. They have to be firm, they have to be quick, and they have to be appropriate. And then if, in essence, once the, that, that time has expired and then you give them a chance and then you bring them back. Uh, uh, the six is not everything can be uh, located in the same place. Not everything can be organized. And, and, I got, and I gotta say, this is probably one of the most important areas, I know the mayor talks about this a lot, is uh, what goes on in the parks in this community. So many people, well-intended, well-meaning groups, bring food in and in the mm -hmm. park, and that's sort of staying on that bottom of the pyramid. It, 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 it's, and, it, and not only is it staying at the bottom and it's not been very transformative, it's like saying, stay right there and tomorrow I'll bring you more food. Stay right there, I'll bring you a t-shirt on Monday. I'll, I'll even bring you glasses and such. And so if you just stay right there, I'll be your valet service and I'll bring you services into the park, and there's no engagement. It's a very an enabling behavior. Um, whereas if you could get the, these good, well-intended groups and public service groups and such to come help it feed at Pinellas Hope, come help and f feed at Safe Harbor, bring your glasses, bring your clothing, and coordinate those services in with these other places that has job training, that has medical, that has addictive disorder uh, care, that deals with the substance abuse, and you holistically work with the individual rather than say, stay at the park. And I, I know that's a big, big, been a yeah. big issue for you. I don't know if you wanted to comment on, on that or not, or at this point, or? Well, we're, we're working with the downtown partners that we have um, to try to make sure that, um, that we have activities in the park that um, it's less conducive to uh, those that just want to sit there all day, every day on a daily basis with, uh, with their knapsacks and things like that. Uh, we're also looking at increasing um, capabilities at the safe harbor, so um, there won't be that incentive to come back into the downtown area that they have services in this continuum of care. So uh, we'd like to program Williams Park, and part of that, exactly what you're saying, uh, stop the warehousing aspect, but come up with a plan. It's not rocket science. Uh, reward good behavior, negative consequences to bad behavior and uh, try to transform lives. We're trying to transform lives in this continuum of care. Get people off the streets, give them incentive to do that. So uh, yeah, the more, the more we can work towards that, uh, we could get people off the par uh, out of the parks and uh, certainly encouraging people not to do those feedings downtown. Um, very negative uh, when all of the services that one needs, the social, uh, the the security part under a street light and the drive-by feedings, there's no incentive to get off the street. So, uh, yeah, we have a long way to go. But what I'm hearing you say, though, is that you don't want those groups to stop feeding. You want them to continue to feed, but align themselves with an agency that's already doing it in a very sanitized place. They've got bathrooms, they've got a place to wash their hands, a place to take a shower, and a place to sit down in, at a table and with real utensils and eat 
healthy food that's been cooked in a health approved kitchen. A absolutely. So you, you're not saying stop, stop that, just align it with it, another In fact, agency. not only are you not saying stop, in most cases you would like folks to double and triple their absolutely. capacity. You, you would like some of these churches, some of the faith-based groups, some of the, the community college groups and the college groups. What we're saying is, can you increase your services, but let's align them in a strategic and logical, thoughtful way that engages folks on the street to get off the street permanently. If you want to keep a person on the street, the best thing you can do is just keep bringing services there right. and say, don't move. Just stay right there and we will bring you as much food, as much anything else you need, you stay there. Why would anybody ever get off the street? It just doesn't make sense. And so the most important thing we can do for these community groups, and they're well intended, and I have never met anybody who's working in the homeless world who has nothing but good intentions, but let's be smart about our intentions. Let's be, most important, strategic. And if you can align those services with all the other services that, that are more high, as you move up, the, they're more sophisticated and you move up higher on the grid, that deals with addictive disorders, job training, job skills capacity, as you move up, that's where you really get transformation. That's where you really get a, get folks off the street. Mm -hmm. So we're not at all saying shut down. We're not at all saying stop. And what we're saying is, can you increase your capacity? Can you do it within the health department uh, rules and regs? Because you, you, you absolutely need to, to watch your temperatures on your hot and your low end cold and have you know clean. I've seen a lot of folks get sick on the street okay. uh, by well-intended programs that weren't following those guidelines. The same guidelines guidelines for any other restaurant we go to and eat at should be followed when you're street feeding. If not, you're doing a disservice to the folks you're trying to help. But it, it is the enablers that are out there. And you look around Mirror Lake, there's no incentive for them to go anywhere else because they can, you know, the, our, our residents that live on the street, they can uh, spend their days at the senior center. They get three squares a day. They get coffee and snacks at night. Uh, they can look over the lake and, and spend their afternoons, there's no incentive for them to go anywhere else. It's just too easy. And uh, we have to incentivize, we have to reward, and again, transform lives, give people that ability to be uh, giving members of our community. That's what we're looking for. And, and you, you say three meals. You go Williams Park, I was there the other day, five meals served there in a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going hungry as a homeless is a real myth. And a lot of people think, oh, I got to go take food down and it, it, it's a special holiday or whatever and I'm going to take food down and I'm going to help. Food on the street, and, and, and so you, you would never go hungry in St. Pete, ever. Right. That, is not a, a, that, that is not an issue in, in this community. But it is an issue that the, it, how it's delivered, because it's very enabling. And, and not only does it not engage the person, it doesn't help the other agencies. You know, you got these great agencies like, you know, Pinellas Hope out there and, and Safe Harbor and St. Vinny's yeah. doing great programs. And we hurt their program by pulling folks away rather than keeping them into the program. So you'd want to align with all these other programs. And the seventh principle is, is panhandling. You really, and, and you all have probably done the best, I think, in the nation in, in this, this one, is you have to separate truly homeless people from the sort of the panhandling gamer types, you know, who are making 30, 40,000 a year tax-free, and that's just their way to get around the system, versus the truly homeless who, who, who we do need to get food, we need to get medical care, we need to get job, job services for, we need a solid, safe roof over their head in a safe environment. There's a real misnomer in the, in the community that homeless cause a lot of violence. In fact, most everywhere I've gone in the country, it's violence on homeless right. people, especially at the beginning of the month when many of the folks, that, that especially the veterans who get veterans checks at the beginning of the month, get rolled by gangs for their checks mm -hmm. and or get taken to the bank and, and gamed for their check. And so the panhandling ordinance, it, it, it's more than dealing with what, what's on the surface. What's so sophisticated about your, your ordinances and a bunch of them that are really good is that you really get that quick separation from the gamer who really should not be there. There's no need for them to be there. This is just their way to get money and get around the IRS and, and go use it for drinking and drugging 
versus the true homeless person who really needs help, who needs to go to St. Vinny's or Goodwill or Safe Harbor or Pinellas Hope. Those folks need to get into those programs and we need to do everything we can to get them there. And again, giving money out the window or a sandwich out the window is no different than feeding in the park. It's, it's that same enabling behavior. Instead of saying stay in the park, it's saying stay on that street corner. Yeah. And you will never get somebody out of homelessness if you say stay at that corner and I'm going to bring you a sandwich tomorrow morning. Every day. Every day. It, it yep. just doesn't make sense. So those are the seven principles and they're working. The, the great news is in these 12 communities that are doing this are seeing 60 to 84 percent success rates on the folks going through programming. And, and so you're getting these fabulous success rates, and we're already starting to see it at it, it, it even Safe Harbor uh, mm -hmm. now, even though it's just only been up a few, a few weeks now, it has had almost 100 people out placed in referral out of Safe Harbor just already, so. Yeah. Great success. Well, thank you, Robert. Yeah. That was all very, very informative. And, and as we wrap up here uh, today, I'd like to turn to the mayor uh, as we're awaiting Robert's, Dr. Marbot's final plan, because we will have a final action plan uh, produced by Dr. Marbot as how we can do better in St. Petersburg and Pinellas County. Mayor, could you give us a couple of thoughts until we come together again and, and, uh, and air again another segment about what citizens can do to help um, could you give us some suggestions? Well, sure, and we talked about it a little bit. Stop the enabling behavior, that street feeding, but redirect your resources to the safe harbor or uh, to Pinellas Hope. Redirect and, and, and don't decrease the number of meals. See if you can step it up and get into the community, but do it in an organized, safe environment, that safe setting. Uh, and volunteer. We could use oh, as yeah. many, you know, all hands on deck, volunteer. Uh, at St. Vincent de Paul, Pinellas Hope, uh, HEP up in North County, uh, and certainly the Safe Harbor. These are opportunities for the community to really rally and come together for a good cause. We're all shooting for that self-sufficiency. That's the goal. We just have a long way to get there. But in this continuum of care process, we can actually do this. We can do better. Financially, uh, donations to all of these organizations would certainly be a help as we try to uh, underwrite the cost of, of not only the, the, the care, the security, the environment, uh, but some of the care involved in that self-sufficiency model. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people that are on the streets have, have mental health needs and, and not only the, the basic care of feeding and, and the security and clothing, but there needs to be something in their life that they can aspire, that job training, that vocational training. Donations help for that. And we'll await this final report to come and I'm sure we'll meet again around this table. I hope so, I hope so. And uh, to our viewers uh, in the audience, I'd like to thank you for watching. And if you have any questions, you can call my office uh, at 727 893-7627 or email me at Rhonda, R-H-O-N-D-A dot Abbott, A-B-B-O-T-T at stpete.org. Thank you very much for watching and we can do better. Mm -hmm.